All right, let's make a start. So what we'll talk about today, I'm trying to, you'll see I'm going to devote most of it, in fact, to VADs because uh, Dirk's really request was, let's talk about things that not everybody does. So hopefully we'll discuss and cover most of the bits. Anyway, let's go. So the first question, I guess, is, um, and this is where I, I understand there'll be belly laughs and a lot of giggling in the background, but it's pretty quiet at this end. So we'll see how we go with the gags and the jokes and the silly slides. But so the first question I ask is why care? The why care is pretty easy. It's a very common disease. And you've seen these slides probably either from me or from others many times, but it's common about, and it's a bit, a bit of a broad range, five to 25% of the heart failure, it's probably closer to 5% is advanced sort of advanced class three, it doesn't really exist, 3B if you like, stage C, but uh, probably about 5%, five to 10 max percent. It is a condition with a lot of comorbidities and you can see the numbers there, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, AF particularly. And I don't know, I can't remember whether you've covered AF and Alex might come back and do that. But the whole issue of AF and heart failure is a, a talk in itself. Hypertensive heart disease, is either causative or contributory in about two thirds of heart failure patients and of course coronary disease. And it remains even in 2020, a very fatal disease. 5% in hospital death, 25 at a year and 50 at five years is still, I know you think it's an archaic figure, but it is still true. And note again in small print, 25% 30 day readmission. So these are the mistakes and I've grouped them and I won't name people who send us these patients, but I could if, if people would like me to. But these are the mistakes you can't afford to make, it's fair to say in any disease, but particularly in heart failure. First is obviously failure to look, to examine, to listen, to take a history, to look at tests, failure to treat adequately, failure to plan, failure to refer, and we'll try and touch on some of these. The first, I guess, is failure to look and I think it's fair to say that the I'm not very good at JVP's line has got to be dismissed. We don't expect you to do anything like this um, and I've never seen anybody do anything like that except this guy but some JVP's are easy, some are hard like the big fella here but I think with the advent of portable ultrasound with the advent of your expertise now that uh, ultrasound echocardiography is such an integral part of what you do. And I'm, I won't be talking about ultrasound in heart failure too much, but, and I don't want to talk about B lines and so on, but to have a look at the, S, at the, at the IVC, to get a feel for what their volume status is, is such an easy thing to do, not putting the probe where it is on the picture above, but obviously subcostal. Uh, it's very easy. So there really isn't an excuse for you to not look at the venous filling pressure, at least for the right heart. Obviously, it's a bit harder for the left heart, but looking at echo and so on. Um, echo is and remains the single most useful investigation you can do. As I said, you guys have the skill to do it. You don't need to wait for a formal echo. You can at least get a feel for what is going on, be that in the emergency department, post cath lab, post whatever. I would have to say though, and as I said, this is not a talk on echo in heart failure, that cardiac MRI has now become and is really the critical add-on for heart failure. Now, it's not available in all centers. You don't need to beat yourself up, but somewhere in your algorithm of investigating the heart failure patient needs to be, I will get an MRI at some point in the spectrum. And we can talk about that later. So again, this is not to, I'm an echocardiographer. I love echo, but it's not standalone test. And here's an echo of dilated cardiomyopathy, but this is what MRI brings to the table. So it brings the assessment of LGE, scar, fibrosis, um, uh, and you can look at this and say, look, here's ischemic. Uh, I think, can't remember Dirk, whether you said you, you have, have had or are having a talk on amyloid. I think you said coming up, but um, ischemic, non-ischemic uh, with mid-wall fibrosis, sarcoid, other inflammatory diseases, myocarditis, et cetera. 
MRI is really the indispensable tool in adding to the equation beyond perhaps the coronary angiogram or CTCA to yes, no for coronary disease. So it really is a key part. It influences how you treat, it influences your diagnosis, it influences your decision for uh, devices. Um, I think to labor the point, it's worth laboring. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, ARNIs, do all of the important things in treating HEF-REF. And all of this talk is really about HEF-REF. I'm not, not going to touch on HEF-PEF, but they reduce mortality, they reduce and reverse remodel, they reduce hospitalization, they reduce symptoms. Um, the important point is that we know people are getting better at using these, but they are not getting better at up titrating. And the days of relying on someone else to up titrate are long gone. You need to do this yourself or enlist in a vigorous way the help of your favorite GP, heart failure nurses, your heart failure team to help you if you don't feel you've got the time or desire. But the higher the doses, the closer you get to target, the more likely you are to succeed. Diuretics are for euvolemia. And these simple things for treating uh, patients, for giving patients control of their disease, a la diabetes, and we'll talk about diabetes more in a minute, but fluid restriction, fluid allowance, salt, weighing yourself daily way, self-dosing self with diuretics is very important. Um, euvolemia is everything. And I've put down the bottom left there, as you can see, fail to treat. Um, failing to get euvolemia is not, is not an answer in itself. And we see this all the time where patients are brought into hospital with horrible edema. Remember, barely discernible edema is three litres of edema on board. This person's probably got 15 to 20 litres, assuming this is all heart failure. But it's not fixed until you've made the patient euvolemic. If you send the patient home with this because you're sick of them, because you've run out of ideas, because 40 milligrams of oral Lasix a day is not working, the patient will be back very soon with repeat hospitalization. So you need to up the ante, you need to use IV directs, you need to use IV infusions uh, that are far more effective probably than any of the above. Uh, really, would we think about hemofiltering, ultrafiltration, just for edema uh, in the absence of renal dysfunction, but people have done that. But that is, I think, failure number one, which is failure to treat adequately. And this is the commonest that we see. Does it matter? This is an interesting study just published where they took uh, the lifetime benefit. The graph is for patients aged 55, uh, and there are further graphs for different age groups. Looking at conventional treatment, the Ephesus control group, which was ACE or ARB and a beta blocker, versus an MRA, an ARNI, and an SGLT2 inhibitor from the three most recent trials. And you can see here, the difference is a 6.3 year difference in survival just by doing that alone, let alone everything else. So it matters. So let's talk SGLT2. And as I said, I'm not gonna give a talk for hours on heart failure because I think most of you are across this. Most of you have an interest in it, I hope, to some degree, uh, but perhaps don't see the really advanced forms and where they go next. So SGLT2 inhibitors, I think you've all seen the ESC publications and presentations. Um, yep, they cause you to lose glucose, but the mechanism by which SGLT2 inhibitors work to protect both heart and kidney are I think a moot point. This was a fabulous presentation by Milton Packer on the back of uh, DAPA and uh, Emperor Reduce, DAPA heart failure. Glucose lowering, you can see a list of proposed mechanisms supported by evidence. Glucose lowering, not really, naturesis, just from uh, the um, uh, glucose in the urine, probably no reduction in blood pressure weight, not really. Oxygen delivery, because you increase hematocrit, because you dehydrate people a little bit, not really. Different uh, fuel utilization from ketogenesis, again. The most interesting, and I haven't, I knew very little about this, Enhanced nutrient deprivation signaling, sirtuin one reducing cell stress and prolonging survival. So here's this very complicated slide, but it's a whole new area. And I, if uh, those amongst you would uh, wish to give me a presentation on sirtuin one, feel free. But 
as you can see, what they do in combination with metformin, they activate this nutrient deprivation signaling. CERT1 is activated, AMPK, which as you can see over here is uh, adenosine, adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinases. And they activate this whole sequence that basically reduces oxid oxidative stress, increases autophagy, which improves sort of cell health. And you end up with this cardioprotective phenomenon. Now, there's evidence for this, particularly in animal models, but um, it's a really intriguing thing. And of course, I think we've, we've just batted on with the trial data with really not understanding what it's about. The trial data, I think you are again, right across DAPR HF here, you can see um, composite endpoint presence, regardless of, of the presence or absence of diabetes. Um, and the more recent EMPRA reduced similar benefit. The difference appeared to be, and this has been a point of great controversy um, in the mortality itself, not so clearly reduced. Uh, look, it's a point that we can debate. I think it will, we will probably conclude that it is a class benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, whether you're going to see a head-to-head -head trial between the two to sort of resolve this issue of the not quite significant cardiovascular death reduction with empagliflozin, empagliflozin, depending on your, where you come from, uh, I think we can debate. But bottom line is both of them achieved a very significant primary endpoint. John McMurray made the point, he said, they're very well tolerated. They don't do much at all in terms of side effects that we've traditionally associated with other drugs. Hyper, hypotensive, renal function, fairly stable. They're easy to use. Packer goes on to say the addition of both of these agents, both SGLT2 and ARNI, in patients already on background therapy, as we met normally mandate, would be expected to yield incrementally the 35% reduction. So he, he argues that both of these drugs, and we're talking in the cardiovascular domain, not, I hope the diabetic doctor starts the SGLT2. It's up to us now to take this on board. They're easy to use. There's not a lot of dose adjustment. Uh, if you ask me how many people have I started on, the number is very, very small. But I think we now have good solid evidence for a couple of agents. Uh, they're not approved, as you know, in Australia just yet, unless you're on uh, metformin, but uh, this is really something that we've got to add to the armamentarium. So let's uh, change tack a little bit here. Um, other things that are, I guess, new, novel, exciting in in heart failure, and I know that many of you are lovers of the interventional structural heart disease axis. This is a nice way to think about it mitral regurg, primary MR, the valve makes the ventricle sick. It's a valve problem. Functional MR, the ventricle makes the valve sick. It's a ventricular problem with secondary effect. So valve makes the ventricle sick, primary MR, it's a mechanical solution. The whole question really is for a medical disease where the ventricle makes the valve sick, is it a mechanical solution as well? Well, let me remind you, this is a study put out last year looking at the effect of um, ARNIs on mitral regurgitation. And you can see that as a result of the reverse remodeling we spoke about earlier, there is benefit, not complete benefit by any means, but you can see worsen with ARNI, none, uh, improved significant, but you're still left with a significant number of people without improvement. So Mitra clip you're well aware of, this diagram you're well aware of, um, which looked at the, the problem of trying to relate COAPT and Mitra FR, where they seemed the incongruent results. And really it was all about the size of the heart, the extent of the MR. So this is the COAPT trial. These are the figures I think everyone's familiar with. Let me remind you, very significant improvement with the Mitra clip plus goal-directed uh, medical therapy versus medical alone. Only about half of them were class three. So the question I put to you in your excitement and enthusiasm for 
mitral clipping in functional MR is 30% of the people in the mitral clip arm were dead, all cause mortality, at two years. So it's not an endpoint in itself. Does it improve things? Yes, it does in the carefully selected patient, but be very careful that you are not making the problem go away. So I put this picture together under the guise of failure to plan or failure to failing to plan. Can you spot the difference? I won't ask people, but I'll tell you. The man on the right looks pretty well. The person on the left, uh, sorry, the man on the, on the left looks pretty well. The person on the right does not, very clever. So the difference is that I put this under failure to plan because we would see this pretty much every Friday afternoon, whether it's from our place in-house or from your place or from somewhere else. It's always the other hospital, but the patient with a known poor LV who gets something done. AF with a miserable left ventricle, given a beta blocker to slow them down. And I'm talking IV beta blocker and they crash. Patient who is in AF, who has a transesophageal echo, gets sedated um, and, oops, I'll just get rid of that. Hopefully that's not going to trouble us. Um, gets sedated and ends up crashing. Patient who has bypass surgery with a dreadful left ventricle in the vain hope, no, vi no viability study done, but the hope is it will all get better after surgery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's not about pointing the finger. It's, we all have got caught out in this, and these could be our pictures from our hospital as much as anywhere else, but not thinking about the consequence of what will I do if things go sour is a really important problem that you need to address before you embark on it. If you think you're operating on a person with a ventricle that is so poor, the chance of success is rather small. Well, make sure your surgeon or you or your interventionist or your structural heart disease guy has a talk to, to us, whether it's us or, because uh, what am I gonna do next if things go bad? Am I gonna put them up for a VAT or a transplant or is it palliative? Work it out before you get there. The other thing to comment is in this study, they looked at the annualized progression of so-called stage C or really class three, class three B heart failure. And the point being that it never stays stable. It does progress. So these patients who are, you think are doing reasonably well in class three heart failure, maybe they've been in hospital a couple of times, um, they do get worse. And it is very important to recognize that. So I put it to you that these are well-known red flags, but stop ignoring them. Hypotension, persistent class three or worse, hospitalized more than twice in the last 12 months. Some units would say more than once in the last 12 months. We were, let's say two, recurrent shocks, but oh, they're otherwise okay. Medication, once you start down, down titrating medicines, that's a bad sign. End organ dysfunction, and in, importantly, including right heart failure. This was a study, the so-called roadmap study. It was a VAD study uh, looking at people um, in the Intermax group that I'll talk about in a moment, class four to seven. So these are outpatients, class four, uh, pretty sick, five, six, seven are getting better, but they're home not, and not an inotrope. Seven would equate to about a, an Intermax seven, about a class three B. And you can see in the medical arm, 41% had an event death, delayed VAD or urgent transplant by the two year mark. So these are sick people. So when you see this severe symptoms, so, you know, all of these pictures, all of these things, they are all too late, all right? Severe symptoms, severe cardiac dysfunction. Anytime you see right heart failure that looks like this, these people are way, way down the track and you have either seen them for the first time and it's very late in their illness or you've been managing them for way too long and ignored it that's too late but don't despair there are other people despairing and i'm sure there are miserable collingwood supporters out there now this is a reason for despair but even then there is hope so collingwood recruited uh, 
Ryan Atkinson is one of their key members, and I think things can only get better. So let's uh, let's move on. And I've said, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. So what are the options for these very advanced heart failure patients? The first heart transplant was done in 1967. Uh, Christian Barnard at Grutescua in, uh, uh, in Cape Town. Um, and in 1982, 15 years on, the first LVAD was put in by Bill DeVries, uh, was a Jarvik 7. The patient lasted 112 days. So this enormous heart you can see there was connected to a big washing machine. He basically died of recurrent uh, and unremitting stroke. But let's talk VADs first. Well, uh, and I think it's fair to say that for those of you who have um, not been able to come and uh, work with us at the Alfred, um, VADs are really something that you're probably not going to see in your practice life too much, um, but you will as this continues to grow. I'm saying practice life at the moment, but these are here to stay in some guys and you will encounter these people. And as we'll see, hopefully, uh, with a variety of improvements on what we're going to talk about today. So what's a VAD? Uh, it stands for uh, Voluntary Assisted Dying. We got there first by about 25 years, but uh, our VAD nurses at the Alfred Hospital had to change their acronym because uh, people kept paging the VAD nurses and wondering why we were talking about uh, putting a pump into them when they were expecting to be uh, euthanized. So, um, so we are now called the Mechanical Circulatory Support, MCS uh, program, which encompasses other things in, as well, impellers that you're gonna hear about later this week, ECMO, et cetera. So, but let's call it a VAD. I'm going to call it an LVAD because there are BIVADs, but this is a left ventricular assist device. It has an inflow cannula, this bit here. Um, it has the pump itself, an outflow cannula. So this draws blood from the LV into a, some form of pump, and then is pumped back to the ascending aorta. It has a drive line that sits external. This, this drive line exits the skin here. So these are external, this is all internal. Uh, you have a controller, which is basically a little computer that drives it. It has power to batteries or AC power, um, and that's it. So from this point on, these are all external devices. So internal versus external. If we go backwards, all of the pumps were originally, when I started, external. This is a biventricular system, but these were external. The first rematch trial versus heart failure, which showed the benefit of these devices was this enormous pump here called the Novacore. That was implanted, but again, all the external. So we haven't moved on too much from the first early trials. Um, and I'm sorry, here's X, uh, the rematch here. The, if we look at more recent pumps, this is a fully, in, no, I take that back, an implanted pump, but the external device, driveline, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a, an axial flow pump. We come to our current crop. There are two of them. And mostly for us, we're using this one, the HeartMate 3, two different companies. This one uh, is the Abbott pump. This is the Medtronic pump. This is the one we use most, but we still use some of these. Pretty similar. We've moved on from the axial flow to centrifugal spinning devices in here. And there are smaller devices coming. So, the aim is that these devices will continue to get smaller. They are non-pulsatile, unlike the early pumps back here. These gave a pulse. None of these continuous flow devices have a pulse. The implants will become less invasive, less blood trauma, and they will be fully implanted. So we mean that there will be no external um, driveline at all. And the drive line is key where it breaches the skin because it's a source of, uh, of significant infection. This is the current device, as I said, the blood. So you have a pump spinning here, uh, a motor here. It's fully magnetically levitated. You have fairly good clearances for blood flow. That's very important in this because you get shear stress, injury, von Will uh, acquired von Willenbrand, uh, factor deficiency, a lot of damage to red cells in our earlier pumps. It's a lot better now, but you have nonetheless a focus for uh, thrombus formation and nidus for thrombus. Interestingly, it gives a, a little intrinsic pulse to the device 
uh, where it slows down, speeds up about 30 times a minute. Now, whether that's useful, it's probably useful at washing the pump more than it is to give the patient a pulse. You know, we can debate endlessly, do we need a pulse? Uh, well, God made us with a pulse, do we still need it? Yeah, it's a moot point, but um, we are nonetheless, these are all pulseless devices in general. This is what they look like. This is the X-ray with a, an axial flow, the HeartMate 2. These are the, the HeartMate 3 that we use now, a little smaller centrifugal pump. Um, and here you see it in the standard, by far this would be 90%, 95% of the pumps we put in would be an LVAD only, but you can put them in a BIVAD configuration. And we've got the greatest experience of this currently in the world with this, with using the HeartMate 3, and here you can see some reconstructions. So the aim of these pumps is that the ventricle is continuously unloaded and the aortic valve either should, well, should either not open um, fully or open intermittently. And we don't like it to stay closed because it will fuse. Um, and if, it, if it's not opening at all, you're probably over pumping. You want the left ventricle to contribute a little bit to flow. But the ulterior pulse is significantly diminished or absent. And in most people, we can only detect the pulse with a Doppler. Some you can. 70 to 8 is the aim. Higher than that, the risk of stroke, particularly hemorrhagic stroke, goes up. These pumps, and I'll show you in a moment, are preload dependent and afterload sensitive. Now that's quite different to the human heart. I'll take you down here. The preload dependency, I'll show you on a graph in a moment, is about a third the human heart. The afterload sensitivity, it's about three to four times more sensitive. What does that mean? It means that if you increase the afterload, the pump doesn't like it. Unlike the human heart, that's very resistant. And VAD output drops through the pump. If you increase the preload, the VAD output goes up. This is some beautiful work that Bob Salomon, one of our intensivists did. This is the human heart in terms of flow versus afterload versus preload. And you can see that the afterload going from 80 to about 120 makes virtually no difference to flow, okay? Uh, throughout the spectrum. Preload, on the other hand, it is sensitive. As you increase preload, cardiac output goes up. So this afterload insensitivity is fantastic because blood pressures of 200, 250, your LV doesn't stop working. Chronically, it's not good for it. If you look at, this is a, an axial flow pump, fo focus on the afterload. As you increase afterload, cardiac output or the flow through the pump drops dramatically. Some, this is in an axial flow. This is a, a um, centrifugal pump. The preload, you see, it doesn't make much difference uh, if you increase the preload through the pump. So they're very different to the human heart. So who should have one? It's very similar as you'll see to transplant, sick patients, low EF, reduced functional capacity. So much so that about half of our transplant waiting list patients are on an LVAD waiting for transplant. People, you'll hear, hear these terms, bridge to transplant, destination, bridge to transplant, the name is obvious, You're putting these in to get people to transplant destination therapy, that's all you get is a VAD. Now we would prefer to see these terms disappear because the crossover rate is approaches probably 20 to 25%. You're, you've got it for destination, but you get so much better, you don't, you maybe become a transplant candidate. You, be, you put it in for bridge to transplant, they have a stroke, they have something else in their destination. So we'd rather dispense with these terms. I won't go through all this, but given we're recording this, you can have a look, but lots of contraindications as one might expect. So these are, a, this is a term that you, again, I referred to earlier, you may not be familiar with. We're familiar with NYHA, 1234. Intermax, if you like, takes that 3-4, advanced 3-4, and expands it into these various Intermax profiles, right down to class one, which was all we ever got when this first started, people dying. I massaged a patient to the operating room once, to get his VAD put in and he's still alive uh, well, 25 years later, 20 odd years later. But we would like to have them in the vicinity around here. This is probably the sweet spot, this, in my, this Intermax 4, where they've got symptoms, they're rest symptoms at home. If you put them in too early, you'd say, well, that's a good idea. The problem is, as you'll see, the, the side effects, the adverse effects with the VAD are not good enough to start putting them in in this group just yet. Down here, 
they're too sick often. You get some people through, but you do so at some risk as well. And if you look here, if we look at, this is medical mortality across clinical profiles, stage C, 10% three-year mortality. So there, if you like, your class three. Transplant, about a 20% three-year mortality. As you get sicker, Intermax seven, six, four to five getting sicker. You can see nearly half of them are dead in a medically treated group at three years. So these are the ones and sicker that we want to get early. Does it matter which Intermax profile you are? Yeah, it does. If you're very sick coming to transplant level one and two, you do worse, particularly early on. So the question is, and I'm not trying to flog VADs, so I don't get any cutback from this, uh, is are they for all hearts? And the answer is probably no. Well, not probably no. Transplant versus VAD, classic dilated cardiomyopathy works for both. So we like to put VADs in these people if they need them. We don't, if we don't have to, we'd rather go straight to transplant. What about this one? This is a patient who's got a septal rupture. Well, you can't put a VAD in this patient because of the, remember, you are applying continuous suction to an LVAD cannula. If they have this shunt, you'll shunt right to left. If they have a patent foramen ovale, unrepaired ASD, they will shunt right to left into the pump. So you have to either fix the shunts or they're not suitable. What about this patient? They've got a mechanical mitral, mechanical aortic. I already mentioned that if we get reduced flow through these, particularly aortic mechanical prostheses, you may need to replace that with a bioprosthesis. If they've got aortic regurgitation to begin with, you have to repair that. So again, not really suitable for VADs. What about this patient? Classic ARVC, beautifully crenellated RV. Uh, well, not really. Uh, LV is not too bad. Isolated RVADs at the moment, no, not really. This is a, a beautiful apical HCM. Again, very unfriendly. If you put the device in here, it will occlude because it will suck muscle onto it. Amyloids, again, not really. Small, stiff diastolic heart failure, not really suited for the VADs. So there's a limited array. What about RV failure? The commonest cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. Here's an example of very severe. Most advanced LV dysfunction has some degree. If you are sicker, a la that picture I showed you, that the four pictures of the horrible right heart failure. If, you, if you're sicker pre, you're more likely to need an RVAD post. And if you look at implanting RVADs, you'll see if you get one at the same time as your LVAD, if you get one within 14 days, if you get one within 30 days delayed, your outcome, your survival is significantly impaired. So evaluating the RV we'll spend a moment on, um, it's not an easy thing to do. So without, it's a little bit hard to ask you, but if we were to determine which of these needed an RVAD, and I'll tell you one of them got an RVAD, it's not that easy. The LVs are miserable in both. This one's perhaps a bit worse. Uh, this one's got a device, this one hasn't. Um, this one looks a bit better. And if you said case one, you'd be right, but it's not easy. So what we like to do, obviously the color helps us, this little TR, is have a look at the right heart. First of all, the blood pressure is pretty well maintained in case one. RA is low, PA reasonable, wedge, index reasonable. The RA to LA ratio is a number we like to use. And a figure we would typically see is, uh, this is this is encouraging. Once it gets above two thirds, 0.6, um, the RA is fail is the RA pressure is rising. That's a very poor sign. RV stroke work is perhaps something you're not so familiar with. You can see it down the bottom. It's the stroke volume index times the gradient between the mean PA and the mean RA. Normal's over 700, severely reduced less than 300. So this is well-preserved RV stroke work. So this patient gets an LVAD, supportive for 78 days by the time I did this, and no right heart failure, did well. Let's look at case two, hypotensive, RA high, PA is much the same, and if anything, it's a bit lower. So beware the problem, PA alone as your arbiter for right heart uh, failure or not. 
wedge, if we look at the RA wedge ratio, you see it's over one, it's very high. And the RV stroke work is miserable. Lots of TR. This patient got an, uh, an RVAD a month post. It was sort of limping along with some temporary RV support early, got taken out, but then got into trouble. And then as you'd expect, RV failure, needed an RVAD late, 10 days later they're dead from an intracerebral hemorrhage. Why? Because of liver dysfunction, bleeding abnormalities and so on. So we use the right heart pressure a lot. These are sort of the things that help us to, we work hard to try and optimize these patients before they get their VAD. Getting them uvolemic, trying to improve this with be it diuretic, inotropes, et cetera, um, and trying to get these down. So just quickly, I'll take you through a couple of cases. This is a 59-year-old man, had a dilated myopathy for 20 years in another institution. I'm trained to say that even if it was ours, uh, it wasn't in this case. Miserable AF, I, I shouldn't tell you, but he was not referred, and I kid you not, because his English was poor and they thought he wouldn't understand, wouldn't cope with any further therapy. Um, and that is unfortunately true. Had an out of hospital arrest, this horrific echocardiogram, Draw your attention to the aortic regurg here. Only mild, but watch this space. Uh, presented in cardiogenic shock. Horribly cachectic, pulmonary hypertension, lots of right heart failure and mild MR. Gets a, 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 this is the axial flow pump and a temporary RVAD. What happens? The RVAD comes out. He has an esophageal perforation. Was it related to being so sick? Was it related to toe? Not clear, he was thought he would die from that. Nobody was prepared to operate. He had mediastinitis. Incredibly, he survived this. He was myopathic. He went home after a hundred days, but he comes back seven months later with severe aortic regurge. Our structural boys and girls said that they would fix it. Uh, they didn't, they did, but they didn't. Um, the amplatzer didn't work, ended up with a bioprosthetic AVR because you can't leave this because you have a useless circuit of LVAD to pump to aorta to LVAD to pump. Uh, horrible recovery, finally went home another two months and incredibly survived and was transplanted. Compare that with this man, 43, EF, still miserable. RV looks not too bad, but not entirely normal. This is probably the case I showed you earlier. Gets a transplant. Uh, mild RV dysfunction. Uh, he goes home 20 days later and gets trying to transplanted at 162 days. So you pick the patient early, they do well. Imaging, we love imaging. Um, we do intraoperative imaging to guide the placement. You get the pump placement right, everything follows from that. If this faces the septum, then the chance of suction onto the pump is very high. The other things we want you to do when you're in theater, exclude the clot, exclude the shunt, exclude significant AR, but getting the position right is very important. As I said, it's not the only useful thing a surgeon can do with their index finger. So in theater, if you get the surgeon to push on the apex, you can see wh which tells you, I'm gonna put the cannula here. You can say, no, 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 you're too far around here. You're too far over here. And they can help with their placement. Post-op, Tamponade. Now this is an easy tamponade, but remember the chamber with probably the lowest pressure in the heart after an LVAD is the LA because the LVAD is sucking hard on the LV. It won't suck that down. It might, but the chamber that will, may collapse is the LA and that's an unusual appearance. So beware of that. Uh, you can see here, this is the pump, pretty nicely sighted. This is four hours post implant. And what it's showing you, is that the flow is 10 liters, but the patient was hypotensive in shock. The power is 12. Now, the flow on a VAD is derived from the power. The power, this is about double or more the typical power that we would see in a normal pump. And the problem here is the pump is working furiously to pump it's drawing lots of power and it falsely tells you that the flow is 10 liters. If you put in a right heart catheter, swan, and did a cardiac output, you'll get the real cardiac output, which was about two liters. 
And the problem here, if you've got a good eye, is that this is clot in the pump. And this is the feared exchange. The patient had a pump exchange on that day, but died very quickly short after. So pump thrombus is a nightmare. You can get kinks, and this is where multimodality imaging, this is a beautiful example of the return, the outflow graft with the kink in it, causing low power. Because what happens is the pump is faced, as I told you, with an increased afterload. It doesn't like it. And the pump just says, that's too hard. I won't pump as hard because I can't. Power goes down, flow goes down, and the problem is outflow obstruction. This is an interesting one. Here's the pump on day one. Looks not too bad, although we'd like it looking that way a bit. This is it seven days later, and you can see it's changed. And now it's got a very spiky flow, and it's really stuck on the septum. And this is what's happened is the pump is abutting the septum. And you can demonstrate a similar thing. Every time this patient stood up, they got suction. And what happened was the pump changed direction because every time they stood up, their, their preload fell away. The pump was a little bit close to the septum and they got suction. So perhaps just to mention in this case, the treatment is to give them fluid, but it's to turn the pump down. It's very rare if you're faced in an emergency, you have no idea what you're doing, that you would turn the pump up. Turning the pump up will get you into mischief. Turning it down a little bit, don't turn it off, but turning it down really gets you into mischief and may solve the problem. Survival, well, let's have a look. This is the most recent trial that we have, uh, and we've now got two-year data, the Momentum 3. It was a trial of the two Abbott devices, the HeartMate 3 and the HeartMate 2, axial flow, centrifugal flow. Short answer was the newest device the centrifugal pump gave us two year outcomes. This is overall survival that were, aren't really have been unheard of. When it first started, we were down here right, with VADS. Two year survival of 83%, incredible. If you compare that, here we are here with, with uh, transplant, transplant at two years and heart made three uh, for the first time ever pretty much superimposable. As you can see, these were the original early trials with VADs, different VADs. This was the first rematch trial down here. Um, so this, is an, this was an incredible result for a very sick group of patients, all right? So the problem is, and I can only guess at your mirth at the moment, but do I get excited or not? Well, these results are incredible. I'm so excited. But the problem is, if you look at the numbers, these are estimates in Australia, nearly half a million people out of our 25 and about 2%, about half them have got HEFREF, about 5% have got class four. This is the number of VADs that we're seeing. 0.4%, about two per million. In Australia, we do about 3.9 per million transplants. So tiny numbers. So the referrals, for these VADs is, remains very low. Now, why is it? Is it because we're all too pompous and we hang on to our patients because we think we can cure them? Yeah, maybe, and in many cases we can fix them. So you don't have to send everybody. Is it because of all the adverse effects? Well, maybe, but the problem is late referral increases risk of all of these things, of all of these things, particularly right heart failure and with the consequences on, on everything else. The aim, aim for too early, don't be worried about being too early. We'll tell you, great referral, but unfortunately the patient doesn't have heart disease yet, but good of you to think about it. But we'll fix that, we can redirect. Too late, you get into this spiral of problems. So this is why having a group of people involved in heart failure care is key to success. Um, the problem lies here though, so I said, this is from registry data, not momentum. So as I said, in the, re in the trial data with momentum, the two year survival was 83%. In the registry data, recent data, let's look at it, 12 months survival, 81. However, if it's survival without stroke, infection, commonly driveline, bleeding, commonly gastrointestinal because of angiodysplasia, because of acquired von Willebrands, et cetera, and of course, these patients are anticoagulated, warfarin only uh, with aspirin, but no, no, 
pump failure, particularly clot pump thrombus, 81% becomes 30%. These numbers were the most recent numbers we saw of either hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke, disabling stroke, I'm sorry, all stroke at two years. This was the lowest we'd ever seen, but still 10%. 20% infection, 26% bleeding at two years, 1.4% pump thrombus. And the problem is all about hemocompatibility, or largely, not all of it, but sorry, stroke, uh, GI bleeding, as I mentioned, all of these factors, pump thrombus. These are the, what are termed the hemocompatibility issues with these pumps. To get a fully compatible VAD, we want it to neither increase coagulation or bleeding. We don't want it to fail. We don't want pump thrombus. We don't want just mechanical failure. Remember that some of these bits are outside of the body currently, and we don't want it to inter interfere with daily living. Because you've got these the battery and the controller outside. Having a shower, having a swim is a nightmare because you can't get them wet. Um, so it's not a normal lifestyle. We do get our patients back to driving at three months if they're going well, um, but that's, uh, it's becoming problematic. Um, now that's fully compatible. Yes, again, laughter all around, I can hear. So the bottom line is LVADs are not the only answer yet. So we do need transplant and it's amazing. So this is pre, this is three hours later, and you've gone from that to that. Nothing else can do that. It remains and is the most wondrous thing that you can do for someone with advanced heart failure. It's incredible. The problem is organ supply. And these are global figures, kidney, liver, heart, lung, pancreas. These are the transplant activities. And this furnishes about less than 10% of global need. If you look at it, Spain has the highest per million, that's what these are, per million population donors in the world, 47. Ours about 20 per million. These are donors of any description. Japan's there just because I had a talk in Japan, but uh, these are the numbers. But if you look at what ends up being transplanted, it's less than a fifth, even in Spain. 47 becomes six. In Australia, 20 becomes four. And the reason is because, particularly in hearts, we can't have very old donors. We can't have donors with coronary disease. So if you aim for donor perfection, you'll end up transplanting no one. So it's really beholden upon us to try and expand the donor pool. This is a real swimming pool, apparently. Um, one that in Melbourne we will never see. We'll be lucky to see the neighborhood swimming pool. But um, but it's coming. So what are the donor options? Well, we can look at donation after circulatory death. Remember, traditionally, it's donation after brain death. But the Sydney group particularly have uh, really championed and made an incredible success out of donation after circulatory death. They've used the, so the transmedic device, which is uh, an ability to evaluate. Um, you can even do coronary angiograms on the rig. Uh, this is how you transport. It's a pretty big device, but you can take these, evaluate them, whether they're going to be okay. And it's particularly being used for donation after cardiac death. It's an ex vivo, obviously, warm heart perfusion. It uses blood to perfuse, okay? Um, these are their results of the DCD versus the traditional DBD. The results are incredible, uh, and they have the potential to increase the donor pool. Overdoses, these are, uh, I think these are American data, USA. Um, you can see that overdose deaths are increasing dramatically uh, throughout here. And you can see here the hepatitis C donors track the overdose deaths. So using hepatitis C, which traditionally we did not, is now because we can treat hepatitis C. Here's a, um, a problem for you. The, Manufacturers of the hepatitis C treatment charge, I think it's $30 a month. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, supported by the federal government. If you get outpatient treatment of hepatitis C, if you require inpatient treatment, it's $35,000 a month uh, for the same drug. Hmm, go figure. How we procure hearts is inherently damaging. And we traditionally use 
cold, cold ischemia. So we put the heart on ice, if you like, and transport it. But that's very damaging to the heart. And what it means is that the traditionally an ischemic time, how long it's on ice, if you like, before it gets warmed up, more than four hours, the risk of graft failure goes up significantly. Um, so can we improve the way we store the heart? You've already seen in the other, the, the warm heart perfusion in the transmetic device is really an evaluation rig. But if we look at Australia, here we are in Melbourne, there are four centres, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, sorry, Sydney, Brisbane and Perth, and of course, Royal Children's in, in Melbourne as well, but four adult centres. Our distances and our ischemic times, which are listed here, I've moved New Zealand a little bit closer to us. It's, no, it's not due to the bubble. It has migrated a little bit closer here. But, um, but you can see the distances. You know, this is the size of uh, mainland USA, the high, size of the whole of Europe. And our ischemic times are, are very, very long. So we're an ideal group to study what has been an extraordinary uh, development by Stig Steen and his group in Sweden, where they've used a hypothermic ex vivo perfusion system. The cocaine's in the mix. It's not for the operator, it's in the mix. But this fabulous concoction plus their device, David McGiffin, our head of surgery, is now currently on sabbatical up in Brisbane working on this with 9, 12, up to 24 hour ischemic times, then implanted with fabulous results. So they've got together a project now looking at ischemic times over six hours, Australia's well placed for this. All our programs, including New Zealand are involved. Qantas jumped on board very early and said they would support it. Of course, now nobody can jump on board Qantas, but anyway, we'll get there. Um, so we hope this is another strategy to improve things. Let's have a look at transplant. We'll finish in the last 10 minutes. I hope you're not exhausted. Uh, this is the traditional approach. We used to do biatrial and ended up with two sinus nodes, which gave you uh, one from the recipient, one from the donor. But current approach is one. So you still only have one sinus node. The criteria, again, you can study this, but uh, angina on its own is very rare, I think fair to say, uh, but mostly it's about HEFREF and, and the consequences of that. Just having a lower F alone is not. So you still need to be um, compromised. I'll put them up quickly, but uh, most of these, apart from active malignancy, um, uncontrolled, uncontrollable infection, and so on that you can read, most of them are relative, apart from things like that. Anything that will preclude um, a good five-year outcome is, is an obstacle. Uh, you can see these are international figures from last year's registry about five and a half thousand transplants worldwide. You can see the total transplant numbers since this registry started uh, 20 odd years ago. In Australia, about 140, uh, that's our highest number. Mostly New South Wales have been doing the highest numbers, 130, 140 a year. Average age of the recipient in their 40s to 50s. Average weight on the device to transplants about uh, five months. Half of our transplants on BADS, half of them non-ischemic uh, and about a third ischemic and the rest are smattering. You can see in the blue at the top, the purple blue, um, this is the, alpha, the Australia results, 10 year survival of 80%, international figures over di different era, 58%. Now this is of course many different centers, but uh, this is the beauty of multiple centers, small numbers doing good outcomes. So these are the sorts of numbers you're looking at. Um, this is the risk. You're weighing up rejection and trend. I'm not going to give you a talk on this because I think you know it. I'm sure all of you at some point have worked in some form of immunosuppressed patients, be they kidney, uh, liver, heart, lung, transplant, uh, immunological diseases. You know all this. I won't labour the point. It really hasn't changed dramatically over many years. Uh, the therapies are standard, as you'd expect. Again, a bit of a shift from away from azathioprine now. Most of us are using mycophenolate as our cell, as our antipurine metabolites, but these are well known, the side effects well known, I won't labor it. Um, safe to say, biopsy, cumbersome, um, but this is our standard approach at the moment for looking at patients to monitor them for rejection, be it cellular, mild, severe, or antibody humoral rejection. 
problem with biopsy is it's got lots of limitations. We only do about four or five samples. We don't sample the LV, we only sample the RV. So imaging and alternatives, uh, MRI we use a lot because we have it uh, as a way of saying you do or do not. And particularly what you're looking for is a high negative predictive accuracy. And if you can pick the patients who do not have rejection, you can eliminate the need for biopsy. This is very exciting. We had a presentation recently uh, and there's been a lot of enthusiasm for cell-free DNA because of course the, the DNA from the heart is donor DNA versus recipient DNA. And you can pick this up as a marker of damage. Um, allograft vasculopathy, about 50% at 10 years. Um, and it's interval hyperplasia, interstitial fibrosis. You can see it here, vanishing distal vessels. Uh, they taper away to nothing. And the problem is that the vessel may look, although it doesn't here, relatively smooth because it's a, uh, it's a uniform disease that is diffuse, concentric, and non-calcified. But what happens is you lose small vessels. Uh, if we compare that with some of the other big problems long-term, pardon me, diabetes at five years, you can read renal failure of some description, um, very significant out to 10 years driven. Uh, not just by calcineurin inhibitor, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, but also hypertension and malignancy, of course, the other one. So let's finish up. Um, transplant, here's a successful transplant, does anything, but we've talked about the side effects. Here's a VAD patient waiting for a shower, yes. Um, we don't equip all of our patients, but we will supply this outfit on demand, but uh, difficult having a shower. The problem, waiting list for transplant, no such problem for VADs, no waiting. Um, VADs are gaining though. So I've highlighted to you the problem that patients can't have showers. Well, this is the first device of its type and I'll play it again. And this is a fully implantable system, no drive line, um, power is delivered. This little pedicle on the head is not part of the system as it goes forward, but um, we'll be able to use this using a belt. These are transcutaneous energy systems that deliver energy to internal batteries powered across the chest wall. Um, and theoretically, you could have one up in each corner of the ceiling at home to power these remotely. This is an extraordinary um, progress that we're seeing. So this sort of thing is unheard of, but it's with us now and it's changing the way we look at it. What about bivads? As I said, there is, we're using devices that are really not geared up for bivad support. We're using two LVADs. This is a magnificent invention. Daniel Timms is a Queenslander who's been working in the, the Texas Heart, now teamed up with NASA. Again, David McGiffin doing some work. Look at this septum. So I'll play it again. It's one pump, that size, and that's the moving parts. And watch, so you have to an impeller, but it has a preload sensitive uh, central membrane. Watch what happens, RV filling goes up, device moves that way, LV filling goes up, it moves that way. So this is a total artificial heart. And you can imagine the benefit of something like this for all of the people I put a cross against who are not suitable for LVAD therapy. So let's finish. Drug treatment in heart failure is incredibly effective. You've got to use it. You've got to use it properly. Think about advanced options early. And that, of course, and I didn't dwell on includes palliation. Think about the what if before you do the procedure and the operation. What about VADs? Two-year survival is now equivalent to transplant. Compatibility with all sorts of things with various diseases is an issue. We hope we're going to get rid of the drive lines. And as I said, if you're unsure, you can turn the speed down, up's almost certainly going to cause problems. Transplant, highly effective, 130 odd transplants, median survival in Australia, about 14 years. Um, know your drugs and think of the, the problems. Um, refer early, refer often, and I guess I can leave you with that as my final slide.